Welcome to tonight's student and alumni panel, Is the American Dream Sustainable? The science of urban ecology has revealed that cities are complex ecosystems in their own right. Increasingly, they also serve as laboratories for sustainable innovation, such as green rooftops and vertical farming. Using Chicago as a prime example, our panel will explore how urban sustainability advancements and environmental justice activism are redefining how we think about and work toward a sustainable American dream. The student alumni panel at the American Dream Reconsider Conference has become one of the highlights of our yearly conference, and it gives us an opportunity to amplify the voices of our incredibly talented and inspirational alumni and students. I'd like to give a special thank you to Professor Mike Bryson. Professor Bryson is the reason this panel came together tonight. Uh, he has taught at Roosevelt since 1996 and was a co-founder of the Sustainability Studies Program at Roosevelt, which was with the first undergraduate degree program of its kind in the Chicago area. So thank you to Mike. All right, and now let me introduce our panelists for this evening. Uh, first is Yesenia Balcazar. She is the Senior Resilient Community Planning Manager at the Southeast Environmental Task Force. She received her BA in Sustainability Studies from Roosevelt University in 2018 and her master's degree in urban planning and policy from the University of Illinois at Chicago in 2021. Yesenia became especially interested in environmental justice issues throughout her undergraduate studies and through her own experience growing up in the Southeast side of Chicago, an environmental justice community in the middle of one of the largest industrial corridors in the Midwest. She chose to specialize in environmental planning and policy while undergoing her studies in the program alongside taking courses in the community development specialization so that she could work to promote environmental justice for marginalized communities at the policy level. Yesenia spent the last several years working for community organizations in the Southeast side of Chicago, most notably the Southeast Environmental Task Force, an environmental justice nonprofit in her community and head of the Stop General Iron campaign that garnered national support and notoriety. Now she works full-time as the Senior Resilient Community Planning Manager at SETF and could not be happier to be able to use her education to serve her community. I'd also like to welcome Kara Carpenter, a Sustainability Studies Student Associate and the Roosevelt Student Steward for 2022-23 in the Resilient Studies Consortium. Kara was born and raised on the south side of Chicago through experiences across various fields of work, including co-founding Black Owned Chicago and working as Chance the Rapper's personal assistant. She found her passion for sustainability and decided to return to school to earn her degree in sustainability studies from Roosevelt University. As a student, she's had the opportunity to learn about various areas of the field, including water, waste, food, environmental science, urban planning, and sprawl. Kara is also a sustainability study student associate in Roosevelt's Department of Sociology and Sustainability, and is serving, as I said, as the student associate for the Resilience Studies Consortium. She prides herself on being a people person and cultivating meaningful relationships with others. With building community in mind, her goal is to promote equity and sustainability. Kara holds a strong belief in taking a holistic approach to the field that considers how to cultivate sustainability across all areas of human life. And finally, I'd like to welcome Dan Livers. Dan is a Roosevelt alum who earned his BA in Sustainability Studies in 2021. He was a returning learner taking his first classes at Roosevelt almost 30 years after graduating from high school. He recalls his time fondly at Roosevelt. In his professional life, he works as the wastewater in the waste wastewater treatment sector and serves as the chief operating engineer for the Stickney Wastewater Treatment Plant which is the largest such facility in the world. It's part of the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District of Greater Chicago. He's a lifelong resident of the South Suburbs and is married with two sons. So with that, thank you all for coming today to talk about sustainability and the American dream. My first question is to start on a personal note. Um, so I wonder what your relationship is personally and professionally to sustainability and how that was shaped by your time as a student at Roosevelt. I guess I'll go first. <laughs> um, sustainability for me essentially is just making adjustments today in order to ensure longevity for the future. 
Um, and of course, this concept can be applied across so many areas of life. Um, and that's what's happened for me as I learned, you know, more depth uh, in depth about it. Um, there really isn't any area in my life that sustainability hasn't been influenced by relationships to work to school to my daily routines like i'm always thinking about like new ways um and how i could create a more sustainable way of living um and of course you know this looks like making sure that i'm taking time to rest uh giving intentional time to my relationships um it looks like taking time for myself practicing mindfulness, um, you know, practicing mindfulness around what I'm consuming and what activities that might be increasing my carbon footprint. Um, yeah, by doing these things, I feel like I'm allowing myself and the world around me to thrive um, and be sustained long term. One of the one of my favorite courses at Roosevelt uh, was SUST 101 Humans in Nature. Um, of course, that was taught by uh, Professor Bryson. Um, we explored a book uh, by Aldo Leopold called A Sand County Almanac. Um, this book just opened me up to a lot of new thought processes and ideas surrounding around the concept of nature and what it means to not just simply partake in it and be a spectator from afar, but to truly like become a part of it and realize that we as human beings are indeed nature as well. Um, and so when we finally grasp that concept, we would then begin to, of course, treat the outside world with the proper respect. Unfortunately, us as Americans, uh, through conditioning of many years, uh, have grown accustomed to doing things just the way that we do them, you know. Uh, and, you know, and the way we do them, unfortunately, is we, we've all, very, you know, we've basically created like this cognitive dissonance around uh, how we treat the land, right? So just after taking this class, um, after taking that class, I never really looked at the world quite the same way. Um, and so I'm now way more aware of my place and where I stand regarding my moral responsibility as a human, you know, human being to just properly cultivate the land and properly support the land. That's all I would say. Fantastic. Dan, how about you? Uh, sure. Uh, first of all, hi, Kiera. Hi, Yusinia. Good to see you again. Thanks for that introduction, Andy. Thank I don't you. know if I don't know if oh, you yeah. introduced yourself. Did By you? By the way, I'm Do Andy Therese. Who you are? I'm a professor of political science at uh, Roosevelt University. Um, and I'll be I'll be moderating today. <laughs> Very good. Um, so uh, my experience with sustainability for my uh, my adult life, every company I worked for was always trying to reduce waste, uh, reduce their electric bill, their water consumption, always driven by the bottom line, not some altruistic movement to save the world. It was just really expensive to be wasteful. Um Probably seven years ago, I sat in a meeting where somebody used the word sustainability, and uh, and I, I went and looked it up, and you know this thing that we've been practicing um, for economic uh, reasons turned out to be a, a much bigger thing than than I thought it was. I have two sons. I have a vested interest in this world being something that they can live in. Um, you know, we have done a pretty good job of screwing things up to this point. Um, but fortunately, we realize it. And, uh, you know, the first step in uh, fixing something is admitting that there's something wrong. And uh, we've got to that point. I, um, I currently work in the wastewater treatment sector. Uh, <clears throat> the company that I work for has been in the sustainability business for many years. We have used biogas to run our boilers for decades. We create a, um, a, a soil additive called biosolids. And, uh, and over the last seven years, we have ramped up our efforts to harvest phosphorus out of the wastewater stream. And uh, nutrient pollution is one of the biggest things we face today. Um, water, uh, you know... Uh, 
excess nutrients in the water, creating eutrophication, dead patches. And um, uh, yeah, yeah. And I, I took, uh, I think the first class I took, sustainability class, was the water class uh, with uh, Carla. Uh, and it was, yeah, it was eye opening. A little overwhelming. That, that would be my one thing with, with sustainability is uh, early on, a little doom and gloom. And there's a lot wrong with the water and the air and our industrial farming system and our production system and consumerism and our waste. And um, so you got to pick your battles. I gravitate towards the water side of things, uh, which is obviously very important. And um, but uh, but yeah, it, it is a very broad field. You learn something new daily in the sustainability field. And, uh, and I'm glad to be a uh, part of this panel. And with that, I'll, I'll pass. Thank you. Thank you. Hi everyone. Um, as Andy mentioned in the introductions, my name is Yesenia Balcazar. You she, her pronouns. Um, so Roosevelt greatly uh, shaped my relationship with sustainability, particularly in the equity component uh, of it, as you know, it's composed of three E's. Um, and that's largely due in part because of uh, my own personal lived experience. Um, in my intro, you know, Andy mentioned that I am from the southeast side of Chicago, we're an environmental justice community. We're heavily burdened with a lot of industry. Um, we have some of the highest rates of asthma in the entire city. And we're predominantly, you know, Latino, Hispanics, Spanish speaking community. And um, I, I grew up just really, really used to my surroundings, never thinking anything of them. Um, I think I was just so, like so many of the residents in the East Side, just accustomed uh, to it. And it wasn't until I started attending Roosevelt um, and I would make that journey every day commuting to downtown and and really then did I start to notice a stark difference in different neighborhoods and especially with downtown and, and how different it looked to my own and um, you know I had originally gone into the program uh, for my love of the environment and, and nature right and um, it was uh, the urban sprawl and planning course um, in the sustainability program where I I learned so much about environmental justice and and how my my own environment is shaped so much by urban planning and policy and how um, it's really just it's outlined for people right it, it's a prescribed thing it's, it's very intentional and um, that just really opened up my eyes to, to the injustice of it. And of course, really hit home for me, um, for my people, for my neighbors, my family, that ultimately just deserve so much more. Um, and, and so Roosevelt just really deeply impacted that, right? I'm, I'm living here all my life in the Southeast side and it wasn't until, you know, I I'm, get thrust into higher education that that I realize these things. Um, so, and, and I think it's a lot, um, it's something that a lot of the, the residents to this day don't don't realize, right? It's it's that privilege that um, I have to, to have to education. Um, but with all that being said, um, it's really shaped my whole professional <laughs> journey. Um, as a result, I, I went on to get my master's in urban planning and policy, specialized in environmental planning and policy. And, um, you know, I, and now I'm so grateful to be um, working full time at the Southeast Environmental Task Force, you know, really the, the powerhouse that, that drives environmental justice policy and movements um, within the Southeast side of Chicago. So it's, it's great. I'm so happy to be giving my education back. Grateful to Roosevelt for that um, and for the Sustainability Studies program. So with that, I'll pass it back to Andy. 
Well, thank you all for sharing those stories. I, I find that very inspirational. And it kind of leads me to two questions which go in completely different directions. So you can choose either or, or both, whatever you want to do. So on the one hand, I feel like it's, um, it's really interesting to hear how you became uh, kind of interested in sustainability from a personal level. So I'm curious, as someone who does the usual things uh, in terms of recycling, whatever, but I think I and a lot of other people often wonder like, what else can I do? What should I do? How can I rethink my life to live a more sustainable life? I'd be curious to hear about that. And then related to that, to go kind of macro, you know, Dan, the things you're talking about, um, I sometimes feel like is the answer to sustainability that we can find profitable ways where businesses feel like they can't not be sustainable because it makes the money. And where that doesn't work, what's the answer to try to create um, a more sustainable environment for companies that maybe that don't have that working for them? So those are, I know those are, those pulling completely different directions. So whichever you want to answer is fine by me. Um, yeah, I'll get started. The, um, I guess I'll take the second question. So that would be ideal, right? That the, the, to create an environment where a company wants to be green, to be sustainable and socially responsible because it's the right thing to do, but there's also money to be made. Um, how was that done? You, you said you touched on it. A lot of that's done through uh, through legislation, regulation. It, you can create an environment where it's just too expensive to not do the right thing. Um, it's, uh, it's a slippery slope for sure. Um, but, um, you know, right now, uh, I'll just speak for the, uh, the the retail side of things. So if you have a building that is um, LEED certified, and I'm a LEED Green Associate, um, and you have a building like, like Roosevelt, for example, is, a, I believe, a gold level LEED building. Uh, that's attractive. It's attractive to be part of that. People w want to work in an environment like that, not some, you know, lousy, run down, inefficient, hard to heat, hard to cool, eyesore. Um, but, you know, if, uh, if city planners were to keep an eye on that, on, uh, on what people want, um, and what, what people, eh, money will always works into it. Right. I, I, a, a lot of classes I took, I would, we'd have, we'd have a great discussion and I'd always bring it back to the money. Well, how much would that cost to put solar panels on every house in the neighborhood? And how, um, how much does it cost to not do it? That's, you know, that, that's the other thing, but um, I'll, um, yeah, but yeah, just to make it more desirable to do it than not do it. And, uh, and I, I think uh, companies would follow suit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So. Yeah, I want to add to that because I think it's interesting. Um, I find that like what you said, like, you know, when it looks nice, when it's like a hip, you know, green space, uh, people do catch on. And I feel like, you know, with like different restaurants and stuff, you know, if if a lot one person does it, if it's like hip, more people will, will do it. Um, uh, what comes to mind for me is a restaurant in Lakeview called Uncommon Ground. Um, they recently closed like their their Edgewater location, but they were actually voted the greenest restaurant in America in 2011. Mm -hmm. And um, they ran completely on solar panel uh, power. Uh, and they started a rooftop farm, you know, and it actually included two honeybee producing farms. Um, and I believe they were, you know, the first to get certified organic America or something like that. Um, but yeah, that allowed them to, you know, be self-sustaining, you know, when it came to produce. Right. So uh, and I feel like that was a big deal. But I don't think a lot of people knew about it. But I felt like if enough people knew about that business about that restaurant more people would do it because you know it's hip and i feel like that helps push policy if that mm. makes sense so yeah yeah you said would you like to add to that yeah absolutely um 
I love how like Kira and Dan are hitting on like the positive examples, right? Um, because absolutely, I think when you look on the flip side of that, um, an example that comes to my mind is, is General Iron, um, which is located in, in the north side in Lincoln Yards. And that's also hits very close to home because um, we just got their permit denied for them to move to the southeast side. But, um, you know, the, the residents in Lincoln Yards did the exact same thing. Well, Dan's clapping. Thank you. <laughs> but, um, yeah, no one, no one likes to see that right no one likes to live amongst that um and the multiple uh protests that we had at the site you know we would get the same comment and response every time of like oh my god this site just looks so rudimentary it looks like it has not made any changes technologically or sustainability wise or you know anything of that nature and so um with their relocation promises what came with that right was the promise that they would be they would become a green company that they would um have all the new sustainable practices that they would be enclosed you know um all of that but i think the history of of a company and its its processes is also just really important when it comes to its image because people don't trust that then once you're making those promises um so there is incentive there absolutely for the company although of course i always preach that you should be doing it for the right reasons you should be doing it for people and not for profit um but but that's how it goes so well congratulations that sounds like a major victory for uh, some environmental justice uh I, i'm curious so the theme of this conference is the city and the american dream uh professor bryson told me that actually uh the very first sustainability course at roosevelt back in 2009 was called the sustainable city and i'm curious uh for the three of you just to reflect on that and what that phrase the sustainability city means to you and and perhaps what it could mean if if we do things better and what it could mean for the future um yeah i'll go ahead and go um what does a sustainable city mean um it would be uh to me it would be a city that has a vision for the future they're good stewards of the environment. They're good stewards of their natural resources. Um, you know, they, uh, the, the three E's, economic, equitable, and environmental practices for sustainability are um, kept in mind. Um, the, the idea, the underlying idea of sustainability is to take care of the needs of the people of today without jeopardizing the ability for future generations to do the same. And, um, you know, and that, that's what a sustainable, sustainable city would, would offer and not just, you know, hooray for us. And, yeah, you know, we got ours, but, uh, to keep an eye on, you know, future generations and, uh, and the impact we have on them. Yeah, I, I agree with, uh, with you, Dan. Um, Right, uh, we a sustainable city is like access to equitable resources, right? Uh, then you know, then you look at around and like everybody's you know has electric cars now. So a sustainability, a sustainable city looks like car charging stations. Um, it looks like public transportation, you know, that reaches all parts of the city. Um, it looks like more green spaces, more public green spaces, more more buildings. Um, and then also, I don't know, for me, a sustainable city looks like, you know, I, I just think of community, right? Um, because, right, a true sustainable city, you know, the community members matter, you know, community members are able to just rely on each other for what they need. Um, so think of access, I guess, <laughs> if that makes any sense. Right. This question oh, had so near and dear to me with my planning background. Um, 
Gosh, and because of that, I think I want to say that to me now a sustainable city means um, ooh, more women and people of color in the urban planning field. <laughs> I think um, allowing community residents a seat at the decision making table, um, not leaving them out of policy, right? A sustainable city is one that doesn't just like boast its its downtown area and like put that on all the brochures and pamphlets. It's one that takes care of of its every neighborhood. Um, I think Kira touched on that greatly. It takes care of its own. And um, I think a lot of, I know a lot of the times, right, city officials and, and planners and departments, um, they as I would love to pretend that those disinvested parts did not exist. It's not part of their propaganda or advertising or, or vision or whatever you want to call it. But um, in my mind, it's just, it's about inclusion. I include them in that process. Um, let them sit at the table. Let them be the decision makers. You know, trust their expertise because at the end of the day, a lot of the times uh, the community resident holds more expertise than the planner or the developer um, so often. So that's what it looks like to me. You know, hearing all of you talk about this, uh, it makes me think sometimes, are, are we are we thinking about the city all wrong in the sense that I think there's a long history in our country of seeing cities as uh, the problems, right? They're the source of pollution or or you know they're the source of various social ills that people worry about uh and when in fact if you look at it and you take the sustainability lens you could see uh a real cause for optimism that the city is maybe the answer right that it is a place even in a city segregated city like chicago where there is a greater mixing of peoples of color and different backgrounds and whatnot where mass transit provides a more environmentally friendly solution than the private car um, where we share certain uh, communal institutions that provide a kind of public good that you don't find, let's say, in you know less densely settled rural areas. Um, so I'm wondering if if all of you were going to make the case for um, the city as kind of a key aspect. I'm sort of forcing you to do this, I guess. Uh, the key aspect of an American dream, or a key aspect of the American dream, can you envision if we really applied this idea of sustainability? Uh, to include a really holistic approach that you're talking about, right? Inclusion in a really broad way, meaning not just the environment, but the people in that environment. Um, is the city potentially the answer to a lot of things that we struggle with right now as a society, not just environmentally, but even beyond that? And uh, just to mix up the order, uh, uh, Yuseni, would you like to take the first crack at this one? Yeah, uh, that's cool with me. Um, I'm, I think it's obvious I'm a huge advocate for the city, right? Um, I love cities so much. I think there's just so much potential um, surrounding them. There's a lot of problems with them. Oh my gosh, don't, don't get me wrong. That much is obvious. We've touched on a lot of that. Um, but I think when, from this holistic approach, I, I really do envision that as the ideal. Um, I'm thinking even in terms of density, right, the cities are just, they're meant to use um, the space most efficiently um, in a way that harms the environment the least. But I, I'm my mind's like going to all the different aspects of, of planning right now. So like it, environmental as well, um, the green space that can be incorporated in, in cities too is just like also abundant. It's not like this vision of a concrete jungle that I, I think uh, people tend, will jump to sometimes. Um, there's just so much opportunity um, surrounding them and and it is fully possible, I think, to, to create that holistic approach. It's a matter of, again, placing that power into the hands of the people. Um, and I'm probably going to hone in on this a million and one times just because I believe it so heartedly, but um, and, and allow them to to be a part of that decision making process, because I feel like that element is where um, we miss like hitting upon that holistic view a lot of the times, because you can't have a holistic view unless you're considering the whole. <laughs> so, yeah. 
Thank you. Here, would you like to say anything about that? Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. When you were thinking about holistic, I was, I was just thinking about how there's so many layers that goes into, you know, one a, a human being becoming holistic. Um, so like when you think about a city, you know, you, you, you want to think about like, I feel like the individual first as well. Um, so I feel like the number one thing is you have to just think about the people um, and, and like how people can grow and how people, you know, people's thought processes are around sustainability and green life. Um, so when you incorporate the person, I feel like you can, you know, you, you can definitely then think more holistically in a broader sense, if that makes any sense. Right. <laughs> mm -hmm. But uh, so, yeah, if, um, I know Blacks and Green, um, this is a company, uh, they, they do a really, really good job at uh, just educating, you know, the community, right? They bring people in for workshops, they educate people on what sustainability is, different, you know, aspects, they plant trees, they do all these great things. Um, and I feel like when you do that, when you think about the individuals in the community, then you can push further, right? Then you can push policy, right? And yeah, keep going and going. And then even before you know it, I, I, I want to, you know, be a little bit optimistic here, but before you know it, you know, you can have a decent, holistic, sustainable city. I don't know if that makes sense. But. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Boy, I don't know if there's much more I can add. You, you said you did such a fantastic job. Uh, yeah, the holistically is is inclusion. It's it's everybody factoring in not just Michigan Avenue and State Street, but all all the other parts that make up the city. Um, it's it's uh, it's easy to neglect the. Uh, the outer reaches, the fringes of the city, the marginalized areas, but to, but to have a, a holistic approach, uh, especially in sustainability, you know, equitable access to that is is part of it, and uh, and inclusion. Yeah, that uh, you said you hit the nail on the head with that one. That's uh, a sustainable city would absolutely bring their constituents to the table, and and see what what they ask for and uh, instead of telling them what they need. But, uh, but yeah, that's all I have. Well, I, you, I'm glad that, you know, all of you have been referencing Chicago in various ways. Obviously we, we all reside here. Um, I'm curious if we could dig in, we have talking sort of more in general terms about the city. Uh, how about Chicago itself? It, it builds itself as a green city. Um, what do you see that's going in a positive direction with Chicago that seems to support that? Are there ways the city has really not been doing that the way it should, that it's failing or failing to do enough? So I'm curious, how, how is Chicago itself doing in terms of trying to become a green city, a more sustainable city? I'll, I'll take a stab at it. <laughs> um, uh, for me, one thing that makes Chicago a green city is, of course, is public transportation infrastructure, and it's like walkability. Um, and in terms of stepping up our game, uh, we can just improve public transit on the south side. Uh, there's far fewer transit stops on the red line going south then there are going north, right? So like the transit stops are spread apart, right? Um, and so this results in increased need uh, to use buses, which can, you know, of course be less uh, unreliable uh, in getting people where they need to go. Um, and of course, this is uh, just a terrible thing, you know, for job opportunities and, you know, and I just think bridging that gap is an important step towards, you know, equitable sustainability in the city. Um, and another uh, positive attribute Chicago has, um, of course, we have to believe we talked about this, is, you know, the wealth and green spaces. Um, an example is Washington Park, 
Lincoln Park, you know, Humble Park, Garfield Park uh, Conservatory. We have uh, the Lakefront Trail, you know. And so like to tie this all together, um, an issue that comes up is, uh, is that trains don't reach many of these parts of the uh, city. So many people don't have access, right, to these green spaces. Um, also the north side uh, is full of tree-lined neighborhoods, which uh, much of the south side is mostly concrete as a lot of people already know. Um, and then although there's like neighborhoods like High Park and Bronzeville, once you get past those areas, there are very, very few trees and that's always bothered me since i was a child uh you know and it's this is very important to recognize you know because like this is how we can change the community right um i really feel like oh you know eden's place nature center that's one of the places that bryson always uh mentions uh with uh howard mike uh, howard um and it's one of those organizations that does a great job at just planting trees, you know, and just building up more green spaces. Um, I mentioned Blacks and Green earlier. They also do a great job at planting trees. Um, so there's a lot of people doing good work in Chicago, you know, to step up their game. But I just feel like Chicago just has plenty left to be done, especially, you know, I'm going to be an advocate for the Black and Brown neighborhoods, especially on the South Side and, and West Side. So. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna chime in after Kira there. She hit on like all my bones to pick. Right? The city, oh, the public transit, the lack of tree cover. Yeah, that's that's what we deal with in the South Side. Um, man, and and I do want to bring it back to the the money point that Dan brought up. Is like everything kind of goes back to this this discussion of money. Um, because yeah, you have organizations doing the work. Um, you have Blacks and Green, who, whom I love. Yes, um, Little Village Environmental Justice Organization. You know us over here at SETF. Um, People for Community Recovery and Alco Gardens. And and I just, I just think like yeah, just we're always willing to take that that money, <laughs> right? Because um, we're we're trying to make the city more more sustainable. Um, if it, yeah, so we can go on and on about the things that I, I think the city is could do better on um, to be more sustainable. But I, I will sing it, its praises on uh, one thing, um, and that's policy. I actually think that the city of Chicago is doing a lot better with its um, environmental policy and its um, bringing in uh, nonprofit organizations, right, and into that conversation. Um, you know, uh, one of the policies the city is currently working on is it's building decarbonization policy. And um, the plan is, you know, for all the new construction, all the new buildings in downtown, they're going to be net zero, they're going to be all electric, you know, have all these, um, all the nooks and crannies, right, all their bases covered um, to not emit any carbon emissions. Um, but of course, we know in spaces like the South and West Side, um, those communities, they, we don't get a lot of new construction. <laughs> so um, where do we fit into that policy? And so the, the second portion of that is uh, the building performance standard policy, where um, the plan is to, to retrofit existing buildings um, within the South and West Sides to, you know, of course, with how old they are, they're not going to get to that net zero level. But um to be retrofitted to, to replace gas stoves, for example, um, to implement solar panels, you know, um, things of that nature that um, nonprofit organizations like People for Community Recovery and the Southeast Environmental Task Force um, have actually had a big, big hand in, um, in uh, working on, you know, in, in terms of commenting and, and making edits, but also um, we've we're part of like cultivating this this ordinance, right? That we want to make sure includes um, black and brown neighborhoods. Um, so I will sing the praises for that, but at the same time, I will say we need a lot more of that. <laughs> Dan, anything you'd like to add to that? Um, yeah, from my my vantage point. Um, 
you know, I'm, I'm drawn to the water situation. The city as um, most cities have a, a rain jacket design, right? That we try and it rains and you get the water out of there as quickly as possible. Don't let it pond, don't let it gather and um, send it somewhere else. The city can do a better job of, um, of turning it into a, um, a sponge city. You know, they, they do encourage permeable pavement and bioswales and rain gardens and, but, uh, but, we could certainly do more of that um, to keep the water where it falls. Um, interesting, my, my public service message, uh, <laughs> you know, back in 1900, the flow of the Chicago River was reversed and it, it flows out of the lake. So any drop of rain that falls in Chicago does not make it into Lake Michigan. It heads the other way. So to, to be just a good stewards of our drinking water supply is uh is pretty important we we don't replenish lake michigan at all all we ever do is take out of it um on another note uh today is the 50th anniversary of the clean water act being passed oh i did not know that the um the chicago river decades ago in four decades was an undesirable place to uh, to be. So it, it's why uh, industry sprung up near there. And, um, and now the, this, the river has gotten cleaned up since the Clean Water Act. You know, it's taken half a century, but the river today is, uh, is pretty darn clean. Um, it is a desirable place to be. The river walk is pretty awesome. And, and now there's, it's attracting more and more businesses to the what, what's been named the the second lake shore, you know, the uh, second waterfront of Chicago oh. is is the Chicago River, and um, and that that has uh, you know a, a lot to do with the Clean Water Act, but um, but yeah, just a you know the city could do a better job of stormwater management, you know, it, with uh, uh oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> With climate change, you know, we, we have seen an increase in intensity of rainstorms. Um, you know, on uh, September 11th, we had 6.4 inches of rain fall in four hours. That is the average rainfall for the month of September. So, there, you know, that little things like that are starting to creep up. That uh, The 100 year storm appears every three or four years now. And uh, it's, it's not a fluke. And it's something that the city will have to deal with. But, uh, and, uh, and yeah, I'll, I'll close on that. Well, I'm glad uh, there were some, some uh, hopeful notes in there because I am, to go back to Dan, somebody said they're going to go sort of gloom and doom now. Um, Obviously, uh, the city can do a better job with environmental justice. There are many problems, illegal waste dumps, toxic air pollution, water quality access, uh, food deserts. There are more lead service pipes than any city in the U.S. in Chicago. Um, so uh, from among those, my question for all of you is um, what, what issue to create more environmental justice uh, concerns you the most? What do we most urgently need to address to create a more equitable uh, city for everyone. Okay, would you like to take first crack at this? Or? Sure. Um, a big concern for me uh, is the air pollution that has suffocated the south and west side of Chicago. Um, you know, these areas, of course, once again, have higher concentrations of black and brown residents. Um, my grandmother, who is 89 years old, God bless her show. Actually, she's going to be 90 in a couple of weeks. <laughs> um, but uh, she has chronic bronchitis and she lives in, you know, a high polluted, high pollution area. Um, there was a study done in 2018 by the National Resources Defense Council that actually generated a map 
uh, showing where the most and least polluted areas of Chicago were. Um, and the map just clearly ha uh, highlighted like the proximity of hazard waste and toxic air pollution, water pollution, you know, vehicle traffic. It just clearly highlighted all that. And of course, the far south and west sides of the cities are the worst. And um, and we know that, you know, this is largely due to the uh, industrial planning practices that we've allowed, you know, the polluting factories and other facilities like that. Uh, we've allowed those, you know, practices in order, you know, to, of course, make more room for condos and luxury buildings and places like Lincoln Park and Wicker Park. Um, and it's just very important that we uh, do these kinds of research studies, you know, where we know where the toxic waste is um, in order to just educate people um, about what's going on in the areas, right? Um, to me, once we, once we, I keep, I'm going to beat it, we beat the drum until there's no more drum. <laughs> but for me, once we, you know, once we educate people about what's going on, um, in their areas, uh, then we can push a little for we uh, leaders to take more action um, on these on these issues. Um, and actually, Cal California has used a map similar to one that I'm talking about um, in order to inform their policy around environmental justice. Uh, and I just think Chicago can definitely follow suit on that. Um, I'm going to switch gears a little bit. Another issue, though, is uh, food justice and ac access to food. Uh, many people in the city do not have access, you know, accessible, uh, are, they're not accessible to grocery stores, right, in their neighborhood. Um, and this impacts black and brown people as well. Um, you know, some places people have to travel up to 30 minutes just to have access to healthy food and a healthy meal. Um, so, you know, things like this, we need to work on um, these are, you know, there, but there are plausible solutions to get to that point. Um, we just have to work on it. And there's a lot of businesses though, that, you know, do have access to, you know, like uh, I believe Yusinia was mentioning some, you know, uh, accesses to, you know, farms and homegrown gardens uh, where people can, you know, get food and get connected, but yeah. Yeah, high horse. <laughs> Yeah, I guess I'll, I'll jump in. Um, well, this is a hard, hard question because you you want to say like all of them, <laughs> like yeah, it's all hard pressing, right? We got to prioritize everything. Um, but I guess I'm gonna focus on um, the industrial corridors, um, and I I say that because I really think that like the constant looming threat of more industry um, being brought into into the south and west sides is really what is such a huge impeding factor to like positive change you know um and we've seen it so often right at, at setf um and where we're working towards like oh well, let's like create new plans or like oh more events that are green spaces and things right and suddenly we're putting out another fire because there's another proposed industrial whatever coming in right at some point they're all the same <laughs> in nature um and it's it's a tough one because i feel like it this area is something that really lies within the hands of like the powers that be uh, department of planning and development um the zoning board specifically because in industrial corridors are as zoned as planned manufacturing districts. Um, but I think though one thing that always gets me is like people love to say that like, oh, well, it's zoning, it's set in stone. It's like, no, there's a zoning board of appeals for a reason. <laughs> but, um, and, and we've seen it in action, right? The, I'm specifically thinking of the Kinsey Corridor, um, who had their planned manufacturing district zoning downsized uh, by the Zoning Board of Appeals um, so that they can now start introducing recreational things and, and access, you know, public access to, to the spaces they like remediate it to be to be for for the people, for the residents as opposed to being for industry. Um, so 
I think that's just an area that needs a whole lot of work. It's a board that needs to be elected, not appointed. Um, I think that's my biggest qualm with it, right? Um, but yeah, if I had to choose, I guess I would say that industrial corridors and, and the zoning that comes with them. Um, yeah, it is. Uh, yeah, all of them, right? It's it's difficult to choose one. Uh, choose one. Uh, climate change impact. Um, you know, I, I I'm already mentioned uh, on, on the water side of things, but you know, the we have extreme heat events also. Uh, the um, heat island effect in the city where the city can be almost 10 degrees warmer and stay that way for an extended period of time because all the concrete and steel has been heated up during the day. But um, just to, you know, improve tree canopy and green spaces, um, you know, pr provide uh, access to, um, I, don't, I don't know how you alleviate that, you know, it's uh hundred plus degrees for 12 days in a row. How do you, hmm. uh, you know, how do you e extend help to people? But, you know, it's certainly, uh, it's, uh, I think that's going, there's, it's going to be the rule rather than the exception. Um, the climate is changing and, um, yeah, and we need to do something about the, we're almost to the point now where we are, you know, it's, it's mitigation. It's, it's living with what's happening. Yeah. So, um, but, uh, but yeah, wow. That's a really tough question to ask. Uh, all of those are, uh, are, are, are great, great topics. But, um, I'll, uh, well, with that, I'll pass. Thank you all for sharing that. Uh, before I'm about to turn it over to questions, but I have one more question for all of you. Uh, this conference is, uh, the American dream reconsidered conference and, there are many versions of the American dream, but the one I think that a lot of Americans carry around is not very sustainable, right? It's a, it's a private home and a private car and it's ever increasing levels of consumption. And so I ask all of you as just a final uh, uh, thought before you go to the questions, um, how would you reconsider or reimagine the American dream so that it was a sustainable American dream? What would that look like uh, for all of you if you could if you could remold it uh, according to your your idea of what a more sustainable American dream would be. I guess I, I can start with this one. Um, oh man. I take this is such an issue with that term, the American dream now. Um, I mean, yeah, the vision always comes to mind of like the house with the white picket fence. Well, it's like the housing market's a mess. People can't even get a house now. Um, and, I, and I just feel like there's such a bare minimum American dream for so many people where they're just dreaming of clean air clean water and no lead pipelines and you know and it's how do we create a more sustainable american dream i think we just have to flip the narrative you know not just consider the dream from the point of like people that have the means or the the opportunity um to achieve that like traditional sense of an American dream. Um, I, I think we just need to reimagine it as giving a good quality of life for everyone, regardless of their background, regardless of their level of income, you know? Um, yeah, and maybe I'm thinking like very bare bones here, <laughs> very minimum, because I think a lot of people don't have the minimum, but. Yeah, so I think we need to think of a much more accessible American dream and make that possible for people.
Yeah, I'll go. Um, everything is India said. I just think, um, you know, the original American dream as we knew it just no longer works. Um, I don't think it ever worked because it got to us to where we are. Um, so, you know, we have to just revision, you know, our way of living. Yeah, things can be modern and sustainable. Um, it just, we have to think differently. Um, and not even thinking outside of the box, really just thinking, you know, more towards the days of old, but with the modern spin on it, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. so. Thank you. All right, it's really hard to go last after those two. Holy okay, cow. Okay, you guys answer the next question first. Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, how do you make it more sustainable? Uh, yeah, inclusion, balance. Um, you know, we, we are sold this idea of consumerism, of have it now, buy it now at all costs. Um, there needs to be a more circular economy. Um, you know, this disposable world we live in where the, your dishwasher breaks in five years, planned obsolescence. So you throw it out and you buy another one. And it, um, it it's just, uh, it certainly is not sustainable. And, and the American dream uh, you know, the white picket fence and 2.5 kids and two cars in the driveway. I, um, I don't know how many people think like that anymore. Mm -hmm. I, um, my, I'll just speak for my family. Um, I don't know if they're wild about the idea of ownership. They don't like to be tied down. Um, they, um, you know, the idea of cutting grass every weekend and, you know, there's, there's, the world has so much more to offer uh, than being the caretaker of a postage size piece of ground in a suburb. And, um, and I, I, I see that a, a lot with, uh, and it's certainly, I believe this is generational, you know, my, my generation and older, uh, that's what it's all about is, you know, you, you have to own a, a little piece of land and a house and cars. And if you don't, then you're obviously not successful. And I see people who are um, much younger than me who are hugely successful and travel and see the world and their lives are fulfilled and they make a real difference in this world. And they have no interest in uh, they don't own cars. Uh, I, I, you know, I own four cars. <laughs> um, I got four people who drive. We own four cars and I live in a, a urban sprawl. And for me to go buy a gallon of milk, I got to get in the car and drive four miles. And, uh, but it's, um, but yeah, there's yeah, inclusion balance, um, uh, and, and, and being cognizant of what mother nature needs to, you know, you can't just trample all over mother nature and think something's not going to happen. Um, we've, we've already gone down that road, but, uh, that's all I have. Thank you all for sharing that. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over to questions from the audience now. Uh, we have one question. Uh, why do you feel that people and businesses choose less sustainable options? Do you feel it's due to a lack of knowledge or do you think it's due to other beliefs or problems? And Dan, would you like to offer your thoughts on this? I first? will. I'll go for the low hanging fruit and say, because it's cheaper. Mm -hmm. um, you know, our industrialized farming complex is you know, McDonald's can sell a 99 cent cheeseburger because it is subsidized by the federal government for the, the corn to feed the cows and for everything else that's in it. Um, but, and that's unfortunately a lot of people's predicament. They can't afford to buy organic food for every meal. You have to pick and choose or not choose at all. It, it may not even be an option. Um, but yeah, the short answer is it is at this point in, in in the world, it's uh, it, it's really expensive to to be really really green is is expensive way to, to go. Kira, you said any thoughts on that? Yeah, um, I mean, I agree with Dan. I think it's. 
is cheaper. And I think I'm going to focus on the people part of it, uh, why people choose less sustainable options. I think that there's become like a culture surrounding sustainability too, where uh, a lot of people feel like they can't attain it or be a part of that culture, um, particularly, you know, people of color, low income people, their, their primary concerns are not going to be um, to shop organic because it's more expensive or, you know, like own an electric vehicle because they probably can't, probably don't even have one. They're probably relying on public transit. Um, yeah, so I, mm, do you feel it's due to a lack of knowledge or do you think it's due to other beliefs? I'm probably more so a lack of knowledge. I, because I think ideally, you know, people would be like, that's a great way to live. If I could do it, then I would. Um, but yeah, I think it, it's lack of knowledge and um, kind of an exclusionary culture that comes with it. So. Yeah, I, I agree with all that. I just I just think human beings were such creatures of habit. <laughs> we do things because we've always done them. And you know, that's just it. You know, if our grandparents did it this way, our parents taught us to do it this way, we're gonna do it this way. Um, and then as far as businesses, you know, like like Dan was saying, you know, it's money. Um it's what's cheaper, what's the cheaper option, and how I can make the more most income. And that's that's it. You know what I mean? And so uh, we just have to get to the place where we're just breaking out of that mold. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, uh, interesting. So we have another question from the audience. Um, do you think we can achieve sustainability or address climate change in a capitalist economy? Uh, so what do you think about that? Or, I mean, is our system in some way set up for exploitation in a way that's very difficult to escape mm -hmm. and to, to create a, sort of a foundation built on something like sustainability instead? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I is it possible? Um, in a capitalist economy to address climate change, um, yeah, at some point where it would have to be economically feasible to do the, the right thing rather than the profitable thing, uh, that might have to come through leg legislation. Uh, a company oftentimes will have to be forced to do it. The uh, paying the fine is cheaper than doing it the right way. It, that's that's often the case with uh, a, a large conglomerate. They they know that they're doing wrong, and the, you know, just pay the fine, and we'll get on with our lives. Um, but. Um, but yeah, we have a capitalist society, so <laughs> uh, we, we'll have to, the, the almighty dollar will we'll drive that. And if uh, there has to be some sort of balance between, um, you know, profit and, and sustainability, or th there won't be much of a world left to spend all your money in. Yeah, I think well, capitalism definitely sets us up for failure <laughs> in, in a lot of ways. Um, the climate change question, because um, I think to address climate change, we have to stop looking at market-based solutions, but that's what a capitalist economy is based on. Um, so, I mean, it's, oh, it's hard. Because, yeah, like Dan said, we're in it <laughs> and that would take like a complete revolution, right? Complete overhaul of the system to change it, um, which is unlikely, unfortunately. Um, but I don't think we have a choice either at this point. I mean, the changes have to be made or else, I mean, you'll have no society in general to place the system on is the grim reality. So 
I think it would happen by force. <laughs> Kira, anything yeah. you'd like to add? No, I would just, I, I agree. Um, well, the answer is no. <laughs> I mean, it's, it was very nearly impossible, but, you know, we're in it. And we just have to pray for the best uh, and hope for the best. I hope it works out. But I don't, yeah. Money wins, you know, and so, yeah. Um, I think this is uh, maybe an appropriate question to to wind things up on because it brings together, of course, uh, Roosevelt's commitment to social justice. Uh, so um, one of the participants has asked, one of the viewers has asked, can we su successfully attain social justice without prioritizing and including environmental sustainability? So I'm, I'm curious about all of you, how we, you know, at a, at a university dedicated to social justice, how we uh, envision that with uh, sustainability as a key part of that. And Kira, I'll, I'll call on you first since I feel like um, I'm, I'm just rotating talking heads now. I'm, I'm not sure which one, whose turn it is. Sorry, I'm pondering on the question. Okay. Um, uh, I, well, with, I don't know. Like, I just think I've been seeing small businesses do so much well lately. So, so great. <laughs> um, so I, I really, really feel like, yeah, people, you know, there's big businesses like Walmart, you know what I mean, that are absolutely demolishing small businesses um, because people don't want, you know, people want things faster. Uh, but I, I don't know. I just feel like, I feel like small businesses definitely can be, you know, sustained. Um, and I don't think it's wishful thinking at all. So I don't know. Dan, how about you? Any thoughts on, uh, yeah, these I'll, uh, I'll take the, uh, the other question of social justice without including environmental sustainability. Um, and the answer is no, uh, there needs to be a, an equitable inclusion of everybody, you know, access to clean water and clean air and, um, you know, f flood free zones and, uh, you know, all, all the stuff that we largely take for granted, um, that you, know, you cannot mistreat the environment for, you know, for too long before it, uh, it has uh, side effects that we have to deal with. Um, we've tried that. We have plowed under every marsh and field and lake and pond and stream that we could and built on it. And now we're trying to undo that and, you know, and, and give, uh, you know, Mother Nature had it all figured out a long time ago. And uh, some of the most successful cities are just mirroring what she does. And uh, Chicago is, is also on the forefront of that. They're you know, with the uh, bioswales and green roofs and uh, that kind of a thing. But, uh, but yeah, absolutely. You got to include environmental sustainability and, and uh, the social justice aspect. Thank you. Senia, any final thoughts? Yeah. Um, I'll take the, that same question to, um, to conclude. Yeah, I, I don't think it's possible. Um, I think because so many of the issues, social justice issues can be solved with environmental sustainability or, or need it rather. Um, you know, like how do we solve that? So many people are, are working in industrial dirty environments, right, with clean jobs, um, centered on renewable energy, or a lot of the, those same marginalized communities have issues with flooding, so then we need um, better stormwater infrastructure, you know, things of that nature. So I, 
Yeah, I mean, it's intersectional, right? Everything surrounding sustainability is, is intersectional. So you need those environmental components um, to help attain social justice. Well, uh, thank you so much to our student and our alumni for joining us in this panel. It's been fascinating for me to get to hear from all of you and learn from you and hear about your insights into sustainability and creating more equity in the environment we live in. So I appreciate that. And thank you to everyone who tuned in tonight. Um, we have more events coming up in the coming days. So I hope uh, people will tune in for those as well. But thank you to our panelists for tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Have a nice one.